it's been kind of a gradual progression from being a performer to kind of creating uh, participatory performances with the public to creating sculptures that also kind of facilitate, in a way, performances with people um, as they interact with the sculptures. Well, hello and welcome back to the Quest for Zest. Today, I am meeting up with musician and artist Steve Parker, and he makes amazing interactive musical soundscape sculptures. Also does big old participatory sound installations that are just phenomenal, so I'm excited to talk with him. He works out of his garage making most of his sculptures, so I'm gonna go meet up with him. Steve, good to hey, see you. how's I, it going? I found you. Yep. Here I am. So this is your garage and you use it as your yeah, studio uh, workspace? Yeah, this is where I work and make things. Yeah, so got a nice collection of uh, some spare parts on the wall here and um, in the midst of uh, doing a couple other projects at the moment. So cool. Well, I'm an, an admirer of your work and it's like part music, part sculpture, sometimes part performance. Like, did you start as a musician, start as an artist? Like, how did you blend all those things? Yeah, I started as a musician. I'm trained as a, uh, mostly in like classical orchestral music. I started out as a trombone player. Um, and I've done a number of different things in sort of like jazz and contemporary music. And um, it's been kind of a gradual progression from being a performer to kind of creating uh, participatory performances with the public to creating sculptures that also kind of facilitate in a way performances with people um, as they interact with the sculptures. You know, that's an interesting way, the way you phrased it, I hadn't really thought about that, but when you put a sculpture somewhere that's interactive, you're also building a performance. Yeah, I'm really interested in sculptures that kind of facilitate performances with people. They are in a way kind of like a calcified composition that um, help people to become performers themselves. And then the artwork um, ends up being, uh, feature, features the perform, the, not the performer, but the viewer who is a performer uh, as a part of the artwork. So it's, uh, the, the artwork can only exist when there is a person activating it. Ooh, that one almost has a whistle to it. <laughs> got a little whoopee cushion in there. I got a little bit, um, I felt a little bit lonely uh, playing trombone um, because you're kind of limited as a trombonist and what you can do you, in a certain sense you're there's there's something really beautiful about it but um the the moments are really fleeting um which led me to kind of work with people and create performances but again those are there those those situations are beautiful but also fleeting and there's just so much uh energy and time that goes into something that only lasts for a, a certain amount of, of time. And it was much more fulfilling for me to, to make things with my hands and to make things that could last and to facilitate performances that can happen even when I'm not there. So that's really where I think at this point I feel most comfortable. That's awesome. Yeah, you're like building um, impromptu orchestras yeah, all, all over the yeah, place. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know if you'd call it an orchestra, but performances. Oh no, yeah, ensembles, yeah, 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 for sure. 
And um, and also really interested in, in this idea of um, creating situations where anyone can be a performer or um, can be expressive in their own way. I think is, is can be just as powerful as a, a professional performance. It, these cacti have, well this one has a contact mic attached to it. And then you can play this almost like a tiny thumb piano. The most dangerous instrument? Yeah, and it's, uh, <laughs> And it's connected to these drums up above, which are kind of like resonators for the sound. You've got a natural instinct for cacti quills. Thank you. How did you get from like, you know, studying trombone to building totally off the wall sculptures that people interact with, with, you know, reclaimed instruments and everything else? Good question. Well, I mean, I, I started playing trombone, then I, I mean, it was, it was a gradual evolution. Um, I started out by playing trombone, eventually integrating electronics and some prepared effects, which is like, you know, adding objects or construction materials to an instrument, so things that don't belong there. What's and an example of that? So, I mean, like the most famous example of that would be uh, the, the prepared pianos of John Cage, who um, in the, mid 20th century would put bolts into the strings of the piano, springs, other things that would change the timbre of the instrument. And then they would just jump around in there kind of? Um, sometimes they would jump, but mostly mostly they would just like dampen or augment the sounds. Okay. So it ended up sounding more like a percussive instrument. I started attaching different things to my instruments, um, both construction materials like tubes, and then sometimes also integrating uh, computer or uh, live audio processing into that. Um, and then kind of removing myself from the equation and then adding, taking instrument parts like I have over here and making sculptures out of those instrument parts and thinking about how those could be utilized as instruments for anyone that happens to, to see the, the object. What was your what was your transition from musician to like almost more the role of the the artist? Because now you're creating these sculptures and creating these experiences. Was there a, a transition you felt there, or did it just kind of happen? It was pretty gradual. Um, it wasn't something I imagined or conceived of ahead of time. I mean, first I started playing more kind of experimental music. Then I started working, I think uh, there are a number of pivot points. Another pivot point was when I started um, organizing the Sound Space series at the Blanton Museum of Art, which features like simultaneous large scale performances throughout the museum. Um, organizing those and playing a role in um, the realization of really large scale performances. Like for example, we did a piece for 100 marching tubas, a piece for 80 trombones, another piece for up to 99 percussionists. And I was really struck by like how powerful those sorts of experiences were for not only myself, but everybody involved, um, where it connected um, amateurs and students all the way to professionals and sort of how powerful that experience was when people were able to perform in this large spectacle together. Um, from there, I started um, creating compositions of my own uh, that were uh, similar in scale, but also um, explored different materials and things. Like one example of this was a piece that I did um, under the Bat Bridge in Congress, under Congress Street, um, involved a, a live um, audio feed of bats that were pitch shifted, along with a number of um, other groups, including a megaphone choir and a conch shell ensemble and other hand-built devices um, made with local students. Um, also another project was uh, this traffic jam project we did, which featured ensembles of automobiles and other things. But I found that to be like really rewarding, but also exhausting. And 
I was interested in finding ways to um, be more efficient maybe, and also finding ways to create works that could exist without me being there. So I started making some public art through the, the really great um, Tempo program here in Austin, which provides people, locals with uh, who have no experience making public art or sculpture for that matter, um, with a budget to create temporary works of public art. And that I found to be really gratifying. I mean, some of those pieces are still on my side yard, retired, my side yard, I can take a look later. Yeah. Um, and I really loved like making things with my hands. Um, it also like a practical matter. I'm a dad now and it's really hard to make a living from being a performer. And it's, um, it's much more efficient to work here in my garage and make things and then put them out in the world. Um, that way I can also be a parent while I'm making art. So it's been a definitely a meandering path. And there is, I don't think there's like a clear arc to what I was doing, um, but I'm really happy to be doing what I'm doing right now. I got, I think the squeaks are more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and then these are, I mean, these are not working anymore, but these were squeeze bulbs oh, here. You, you would kind of honk them? Yeah. So it's an awesome approach to an art practice because the way that it pulls people in to your work physically and then also your performances. It, I mean, you really have a whole plethora of people that feel involved in your art and that is really unique. Well, I mean, I feel lucky to be in that situation where I can do that. I also feel lucky to be here in Austin. And I mean, Austin is really unique in that um, it's a city so that there are a lot of creative, interesting, passionate people. Uh, but it's, I think it's small enough so that there isn't this like sat oversaturation of everyone, like a lot of people, like 10 people doing the same thing. So mm -hmm. you kind of get in certain situations, like kind of a competitive atmosphere. And I feel, I don't really feel that in Austin. And I think that's really unique about this place is that there is um, a really generous spirit among artists. And the work that I do is, is really kind of a function of being in that environment, like feeling and being aware of uh, people like that and just be being fortunate to be in that type of uh, place. Yeah, it's over here. Yeah. Totally wild. Well, it is so cool to see and interact and hear about your journey and your process and how you got here. Now, yeah. I, now I think I'm just gonna play. <laughs> cool, have fun. <laughs> right on. You're a natural. <laughs> yeah, well, th thanks, Steve. I appreciate that. It's been awesome to to see your, see your work and all of the thought and intention about like bringing other people in and letting them have fun and letting them play. It's really cool. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for taking the time to check it out. It's, uh, it's always exciting to share work with new people. So yeah, I really appreciate that. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Well, it was awesome to meet Steve Parker, spend some time with him, and hear about his experiments in sound and the curiosity that goes into his artwork, and also just the fun and play that it brings when you interact with it. Such a cool way to work, and on that note, I gotta get my curiosity out of here, gotta get some sound going in the old scooter, and until the next time, I'm Clark Underwood, and this is The Quest for Zest. Ciao.